Hello, we're here to talk to you about data tiering and how you can save a lot of money. My name's Ben Flast, I'm a product manager at MongoDB, and I'm joined here by Bob Lyles, a director of engineering at MongoDB. For the agenda, first we're gonna cover the current challenges of data growth. Then we're gonna talk about some of the ways to manage this data growth today in the form of various data tiering strategies. Next, we'll talk about what a better solution might look like. And then we'll go through the feature we built here at MongoDB to solve this challenge. Lastly, we'll cover some of the lessons we learned while building. Now, the challenges of data growth. I'm sure many of us here are familiar with the challenges developers are facing with the amazing rate of data growth. It's hard to correctly size your servers when you have data of varying value. Performance demands at scale are continuing to increase. Data is growing at an amazing rate. It's predicted that in 2025, global data will reach 175 zettabytes. Operational and analytical workloads are merging and in turn requiring systems to be able to support both simultaneously. And the required speed to insight for analytic queries is constantly increasing. But stepping back from these larger challenges for a second, let's think about how your ordinary database gets to a place where it's got a problem with data volume. When a cluster is first created, it's got no data on it. It's fast and it's free, so to speak. But as the data grows, it starts to take it a bit longer to find what it's looking for. Eventually, it starts to struggle to keep up with the queries being sent. And you're left with the question, what do I do now? So what to do? Well, we can keep all the data, but we know that that won't be cheap. We could delete some of the data, but I don't think any of us want to be the person that deletes data when there was another option. Or we could archive that data somehow. And it's that last option that leads us to data tiering today and how we handle the flood of information. One option would be a self-managed tiered approach, like we see here. Somehow moving data off the cluster and into low cost object storage with some sort of archiving automation in the middle. Now, this has some advantages. It's very flexible. We can set this up any way we choose. And it definitely will reduce the cost of the storage but there are some disadvantages. Operational overhead is one. There's definitely gonna be some of that. There's gonna be increased maintenance costs to cover this new operation that's happening. And lastly, generally there's no unified way to query this data once it's moved off of your database. So another option in the MongoDB world would be zone sharding for tiered storage. Now, this is an old concept for MongoDB. Um, sharding is the MongoDB approach to horizontal scaling. With sharding, you separate a database's data across multiple servers, or shards in this case, and it's possible to use this mechanism to tier data. This approach would use servers with varying levels of hardware that usually have costs that match the value of the data that they're storing. So valuable data goes on your fast, hot shard, and less valuable data goes to your slow or cold shard, which can give you an appropriate price to value ratio. Now, this approach is great because you only have to manage one data store. You get a single query interface into both hot and cold data. So you don't have to manage any added application complexity, but it also has some drawbacks. Number one, it's gonna be greater cost than object storage, for sure. There's gonna be some infrastructure complexity. And the way the data is tiered needs to match the shard keys that you're using, which may be difficult for some use cases. So with this prior art in mind, we decided to think about how we could improve upon the model. And we came up with a few goals. So the first goal is we needed to maintain queryability. 
Uh, an application shouldn't lose access to the data just because it's tiered. The solution needed to be stable. It can't be unreliable in its archival of data, and it can't negatively impact other operations on the cluster. Customers need to be able to configure performance for their specific use case. It needs to be easy to use. It couldn't add additional architectural complexity to a customer's setup. And lastly, it should take advantage of cloud object storage economics, which have somewhat unparalleled pricing and durability, like S3. Now, of course, there were going to be some challenges when approaching this. We know we needed to handle archive process failures in a graceful way that would virtually guarantee no data loss. We needed to prevent negative cluster performance impact. The solution couldn't require much management and needed to be simple. It would need to handle diverse data, just like MongoDB does today. And it had to provide a familiar query interface to maintain the ease of access to the data. And that's how Online Archive was born. For our solution, we started by looking at the two key components we'd need to utilize, the database and the cloud object storage. Then we thought, what's the best way to connect them? We came up with a config configurable we came up with a configurable and automated way to move data from one storage layer to the other and make them both seamlessly queryable and that's online archive in the middle of this diagram this new fully managed tiered storage system allows you to achieve the right price to performance ratio for your data and save you money it benefits from cloud object storage economics a unified query interface, built-in fault tolerance, and minimal maintenance overhead. One component of online archive that's worth one component of online archive that's worth discussing in detail is our Atlas Data Lake. Data Lake provides an interface to query data stored in S3, Atlas clusters, and a new concept of our own called HTTP data stores allowing you to query the union of data in these various storage tiers. The standalone Data Lake product allows you to bring your own S3 buckets with permissions scoped via an IAM role, along with other sources of data to query. In Data Lake, you map the underlying sources to databases and collections, just like in MongoDB. It's this product that allowed us to give customers a unified query interface into their live cluster data and the archive data in S3 through a single connection string. Now, to quickly revisit our goals, with this solution, we're able to achieve maintaining queryability, ensuring stability, configurable performance, ease of use, and taking advantage of cloud object storage economics. In broad strokes, the feature works as follows. You tell us what you would like to archive data based on. It can be documents that have a field with a specific value or documents that reach a certain age based on a date field inside the document. Then you choose up to two additional fields that when utilized in your queries will improve performance for archived data. And that's it. Once the steps above are done, one of the agents on your cluster begins archiving data off of your cluster in intervals of up to two gigabytes every five minutes. And we'll dynamically expand this interval to minimize impact to your cluster. Additionally, once you've completed the setup flow, we will provide you a unified query interface that lets you query the union of data in the cluster and the archive without needing to consider where the underlying data lies. So no updates to your application logic. Using this feature, you can achieve a mix of hot and cold data that aligns with your performance goals and saves you a bunch of money. Now I'm going to turn things over to Bob to walk you through a demo that covers some of the more interesting details of how the system is built. Thanks, Ben. Hi, I'm Bob Lyles, Director of Engineering for MongoDB Atlas. And before I go into detail about how we built the online archive system, let me first show you how it works. In order to see how Online Archive works, 
I have here a MongoDB Atlas cluster loaded with a sample data set that we obtained from an organization called SailDrone, whose fleet of drones are equipped with atmospheric and oceanographic sensors. The data here represents measurements of temperature and atmospheric pressure taken at various locations across the ocean over the course of several months. I'll be using this sensor data to show online archive in action. Here, in the MongoDB Atlas Data Explorer, I can see some information about this collection. Right now, the data is all in the OceanWatch Data database in the Sail Drone collection, and there are nearly 500,000 documents in it. Here, I have the MongoDB shell opened with a connection to this cluster. I'm going to run an aggregation to determine the average water temperature in a given month. Looking at the results of this aggregation, I can see that I have thousands of records per month, dating back to 2019. My application workload really only cares about querying the most recent data, but if I moved all of my older data to object storage like Amazon S3 to save money, I would lose the ability to query it efficiently. By setting up an online archive, I can retain the ability to query the data while also benefiting from the cost savings of object storage. I can get started by going to the Online Archive tab and clicking the button to create an online archive. The first thing that we'll want to specify is the namespace against which we want to run our archive operation. So in this case, I'm going to run against the OceanWatch data database in the Sail Drone collection. Next, I need to specify a date field to use during the archive operation. In this case, I'm going to use the time UTC field. This is going to be the field that Online Archive looks at in order to determine whether or not a document is expired. Finally, I'm going to specify an age limit. So here, by specifying an age limit of 180 days, I'm saying that any documents with a time UTC field over 180 days in the past are going to be expired to my archive. Next, I can optionally specify certain attributes to use to partition the data. So if there are certain queries that I'm running on certain fields, then I can specify those fields here in order to have my data organized along those dimensions. So in my case, I know that I'll be querying frequently on the data source field, so I'm going to specify that here. And finally, I'm going to review my configuration. So here, I have a copy-pastable query that will show me what documents match my rule. So if I run this against my MongoDB shell, I'll see that the documents returned are the documents from measurements that were taken over six months in the past. And then the last thing that I need to do before beginning the archive is to verify that I have sufficient indexes to support the online archive operation. So here, Atlas is indicating that I need to create an index on the time UTC field. And in this case, I know that this index already exists on my collection, so I'm good to begin archiving. So once I've confirmed the archive, the archive process will begin by first resolving certain metadata about this collection, and then it will begin querying for data that matches the expiration criteria and begin moving it on to S3. This can take a couple of minutes to process all the data in my collection, so I have here in another cluster, an identical online archive configured against an identical data set. In order to see what has happened to my data, I can go to this connect button here, and I'm provided with two options for connecting to my cluster. So I can connect to just the cluster, or I can connect to the cluster and online archive using a federated URI that will provide a merged view of data in the cluster and data in the archive. So first, let me connect to just the cluster. So now I'm going to query the OceanWatch data database and the Sail Drone collection to see how many documents are still on the cluster. So I can see here that I'm down to just over 3,000 documents in my collection. So the majority of my data has been archived to online archive. In order to see that data, I can now connect to the cluster and online archive URI. So 
So now, if I query the OceanWatch data database in the Sail Drone collection, I should see that all of my data is present. In order to do that, I'm going to run the same aggregation that I ran at the beginning in order to see the average water temperature per month. So I can see through the results here that all the data that I originally had in this collection is still present. And all I needed to do here was change my URI. I was able to use the same query in order to perform this aggregation of my data. Now, this archive will continue to run throughout the life cycle of the cluster. So as data expires, so as time goes by and some of my measurements reach the expiration threshold of 180 days, those documents will be automatically moved onto the archive without the need for any additional action on my part. So now that we've seen how to use Online Archive, I'm going to talk a little bit about the system behind it. The first main component to understand is the architecture of the archive process itself. I have represented on the left here a basic MongoDB Atlas cluster. It consists of three virtual machines and a VPC in the US East region. Each virtual machine hosts a MongoD, or database, process. Together, these three MongoDs constitute the database cluster, which is, in this case, a three-node replica set. Also on the virtual machines is a separate agent process that assists in orchestrating the archive operation. In the upper right, I've represented the Archive S3 bucket, which is an Amazon S3 bucket managed internally by Atlas that will contain my archive data. The two squares on the bottom represent the Atlas application control plane, which manages archive metadata, and the Atlas UI, which you saw me use in the demo. To see how all of these pieces fit together, we can start by following the actions of the user in the lower right. The user interacts with the Atlas UI or public API to create an archive configuration. This configuration is then persisted to the Atlas application control plane. The agents that are running, the, running on the virtual machines of the Atlas cluster then obtain the configuration from the control plane and begin running the archive operation. During the archive operation, they query the MongoDB cluster for data that is eligible for archiving and transfer that data to the archive S3 bucket. I'll go into some more detail about how this data is transferred in a moment. The other major piece of the puzzle for online archive is the query interface architecture. Again, I represented on the left the MongoDB Atlas cluster, and on the right, the Archive S3 bucket. As a user, I have two choices of the type of URI I can use in my application, represented in the center. If I use the standard URI, I'm opening a direct connection to the MongoDB cluster itself and will only see data that is stored in the live cluster. However, if I use the federated URI, I'm making a connection to the data lake compute plane. The data lake compute plane is another application that is in charge of receiving the data in my archive S3 bucket that matches my query and synthesizing that data with my live cluster data that also matches my query. This unified view is then returned to my application. I want to now talk in a little bit more detail about what exactly happens during the archive operation, building towards an understanding of how the system tolerates failures like hardware issues or network partitions. First, let's consider the standard case of an archive operation. Here, I have shown some of the basic components of the archive operation that I introduced earlier. Three virtual machines, each hosting a MongoD database process and an agent process, with the archive S3 bucket on the right and the Atlas application server represented on the bottom. The first step of the operation is for one of the agents in the cluster to claim the rights to run the archive operation. This is done by the agent claiming a simple document stored in the Atlas application called a lease that specifies who owns the archive operation and for how long. This lease is refreshed at a regular interval. The agent holding the lease then begins to query for data matching the archive criteria and buffers that data to disk. The number of files can vary depending on the characteristics of the data, but let's imagine in this case that we have generated three files to archive. After creating the archive files for this run, the agent uploads a special object we call a descriptor, which lists all of the files that the agent intends to upload as part of this run. The role of this descriptor will become clearer when I get to the failure case. After uploading the descriptor, the agent then uploads each of the files containing the archival data. 
The agent then verifies that the uploads were successful and purges the documents from the MongoDB database. And then after everything has succeeded, the final step is for the agent to delete the descriptor. Now that we've seen how the archive operation works in the standard case, let's consider what happens in a failure case. In this example, I'm going to show what happens during the operation in the case of a hardware failure in order to ensure that data is never duplicated or lost. Let's imagine that the archive process begins as usual. First, an agent obtains the lease to run the archive operation. It generates the archive files for upload and then uploads the descriptor listing the names of the files that are to be transferred. The upload process begins. However, in the middle of the upload process, there's a hardware failure on the VM where the agent is running the archive operation. Only two of the generated files were uploaded. Recovery begins when another agent in the cluster notices that the lease for agent three was not renewed. It then claims the lease for itself and begins to run the archive operation. At the beginning of its operation, this new agent notices that the descriptor is still present in the archive S3 bucket. This indicates to this agent that there was a failure at some point in the previous run, since the descriptor is deleted at the close of a successful operation. This triggers the agent to perform a recovery operation. It begins to read the descriptor and check for each of the files that was supposed to have been uploaded. In order to ensure that there was no duplication of archive data between the live cluster and the archive, the agent now streams the IDs of the uploaded documents from S3 and ensures that those documents have been purged from the database. In this way, we ensure that only the documents that have been successfully uploaded are ever purged. After successfully purging the documents that were uploaded in the first run, the agent will delete the descriptor. At some point in the future, the field server may recover, and it will perform some cleanup to remove the old files that were buffered to disk. The next archive operation will then archive any data that was not uploaded in the previous run, since that data is still present in the database, um, since that data is still present on the database in the Atlas cluster. In this case, I'll note that we've represented the original failed agent as performing the following archive operation. But this archive operation can successfully be performed by any agent in the cluster. Handling failure was a major consideration in designing this system, but there are many other lessons that we learned in the process of building online archive. First, we learned that we needed to design a process that minimized noticeable impact on the cluster. And I'll expand on some of the strategies we took to accomplish this in a moment. It was also important to understand how the system would handle large amounts of data. Many workloads that lend themselves to online archive will have already accumulated gigabytes or terabytes of data eligible for archiving, and we needed to design something that could handle the initial load of archiving such a large amount of information. We also learned the importance of being able to unarchive data, that is, move it back into a live cluster for more responsive analysis. In our case, because the federated URI supports MongoDB's native restore functionality, this can be orchestrated fairly simply with existing MongoDB commands. And finally, we needed a system that could tolerate periodic maintenance, such as operating system or database patches. The failure handling I described earlier applies to this case, allowing the server running the archive operation to be taken down for maintenance without disrupting the overall operation. On the point of minimizing cluster impact, there are a handful of specific strategies that Online Archive employs to accomplish this. First, there are certain index requirements that must be met before the archive operation will be attempted. So we enforce that the archive data be efficiently queryable before beginning the operation. We also employ a dynamic archiving interval, like Ben mentioned earlier, so that if we notice we are not archiving very much data, we will lower the interval at which we run the archive operation to reduce impact. Conversely, if we observe an increasing volume of data eligible for archiving, we will increase the interval to a certain point to better keep up with the volume of data. There is also a constraint on the amount of data that can be buffered to disk during the operation in order to ensure that there is always enough headroom for the growth of the database. And finally, there is a limit on the number of unique files that can be produced in a single archive run, which helps conserve system file handles and ensures a reasonable level of traffic when archiving these files to S3. 
I hope this information has helped complete the picture of how Online Archive solves some of the challenges of managing ever-growing amounts of data through its integration with Amazon S3. By taking advantage of the low-cost object storage offered by S3 and building a system to integrate it with live MongoDB clusters, we hope to provide the best of both worlds when it comes to high data accessibility and economical data storage. Thank you for watching. Online Archive will be generally available soon, so head over to MongoDB Atlas to try it out.